Um, let me introduce um, the presenters. We have Dr. Cleary Larkin, who um, heads up the Historic Preservation Program in the in the role of director. Um, she's, as you've seen perhaps from her bio, she's doing work internationally, but uh, very much concentrated in um, St. Augustine, as well as, of course, in Nantucket, right? And then mm -hmm. also, also uh, today, we have Linda Stevenson, who is um, affiliated, a member of the School of Architecture faculty, and has um, been involved in historic preservation program um, for, for a number of years, as well as um, engaged in the Department of in Interior Design and had helped uh, direct the Nantucket uh, program. So she'll talk a little bit about a research project as well as just delighted to have um, our colleague and good friend from GeoPlan, uh, Kate Norris here to also, yay, <laughs> um, who will talk about her, the research that, that she's um, helping and, and is involved in helping lead and contribute to in historic preservation. Uh, Kate is, is a research scholar at GeoPlan and interestingly, all three of them have offices on the same floor. So that was, that was kind of exciting. So very much looking forward to uh, what, your, um, what your team is gonna talk about today. I think there are two projects that you're gonna go into uh, deep dive and we'll ask that you um, drop your questions in the chat or uh, my co-moderator, Lisa Platt, and she's been running some of these uh, Friday sessions and we've been uh, kind of going back and forth, but she's going to help lead the, the Q&A. So Dr. Cleary Larkin, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you, Meg. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. As Meg said, I'm Cleary Larkin, the Director of the Historic Preservation Program. And today I've asked to join me Dr. Linda Stevenson, who is an assistant scholar in our program, and Kate Norris, who's an assistant scholar and geospatial database manager with GeoPlan. We're gonna be focused on historic preservation as an interdisciplinary partnership. I had a whole list of projects that I got really excited about sharing, and I think I um, overestimated how interesting the two projects that we've chosen today are. So we're just sticking to two. Uh, first, we'll be looking at a project in St. Augustine that we are really just beginning. So we don't have any outcomes or results yet, but I think the process leading up to that project has been pretty fascinating. Um, and then Linda and Kate will talk about the work in Pinellas County, which has been ongoing for at least three years. Um, and both of these projects will be ongoing for, the, for more years after this. So I always like to begin with a little bit of an introduction to historic preservation. People think it's one thing. I tend to think it's something else. Um, preservation really started as a focus on a building, saving a building, uh, telling histories of European-centric um, immigrants, uh, white patriotic presidents, uh, battlefields, early American history. And by the 20th century, the early 20th century, it really shifted to the neighborhood focus with things like historic districts in some of our oldest cities, New Orleans and Charleston. And today it's really a community focus. We've recognized that these heritage buildings and heritage neighborhoods don't really mean much without the people. So the community focus really also includes this expansion to underrepresented narratives. The stories of people such as indigenous people, African-Americans and immigrants their stories that haven't been told before and how they're connected to place. That being said, historic preservation is still a scalar discipline that focuses on the built environment and place. We work on everything from material conservation to buildings, to sites, lots, streets, neighborhoods, as you'll see, cities, counties, regions, states, et cetera. 
Our projects in HP are always community-based community -based projects. The values for the projects are determined by the community. We believe preservation is about managing change while retaining significance. So we must determine what is meaningful and significant to the community. HP intersects with all challenges of the built environment. And many of these I know a lot of people in DCP are working on. These are not all of the challenges of the built environment, but a good number of these that we are all working on. Climate, sustainability, housing, inequity, development, ecological conservation, and economics. So really our research focus is on the coastal risk because in Florida, the majority of our heritage and really historic places are on the coast. And environmental justice, really thinking about these communities whose stories haven't been told previously. Um, if everybody could mute their uh, selves themselves, please, that would be helpful. So the challenges are too complex to be solved by one discipline alone. I'm a very interdisciplinary researcher. I'm an architect and an urban planner and a historic preservationist. And I realize I can't do these projects by myself. Plus it is more fun to work with others in other disciplines. Lastly, so what we do then is we provide a grounding baseline of information for projects so that we can understand the history, significance and community values before we determine the options. So the landscape adaptation for DeMesa Sanchez House and Surroundings is a project that we have started this past year in St. Augustine. This is a partnership between our Historic Preservation Program, the Center for Landscape Conservation and Planning, the Landscape Architecture Department, and the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program over in IFAS. i hide my floating control real quick. Hang on one second. There we go. So Historic St. Augustine, Inc. This is our direct support organization at UF that helps to steward the 40 plus buildings that are owned by the state over in St. Augustine. This is important because they give us the Historic Preservation Program funding every year to teach students how to become stewards of these properties. So every year we study a building um, through classes, through research and documentation, through graduate assistantships. And last year, we did a historic structures report for the DeMesa Sanchez House. This was constructed around 1763 with alterations pretty much every century since then. What's great about Historic St. Augustine, Inc. is that they've had a long history of working on and understanding buildings in St. Augustine. And all of the projects had a period of archaeology and restoration in the 1970s and 80s. The archaeology was led by FSU professor Dr. Kathy Deegan, and the restorations were led by Herschel Shepard, who was an architect and a UF architecture and preservation faculty. And Kathy and Herschel worked so closely together, which is a great initial demonstration of interdisciplinary work that helps to provide data and knowledge for a project. The DeMesa Sanchez House is located in the northern part of the old historic St. Augustine district. So here's the district. This is the Bridge of Lions that crosses the Matanzas River. Um, if you zoom in, you see the Castillo here. The red dot is the DeMesa Sanchez House. It's located on St. George Street with a density of a lot of buildings. But what I want you to focus on is that between the house and the Matanzas River, there's a lot of land. There's the Castillo San Marcos. There's their parking lot to the south and A1A. This is a diagram at the colonial quarter that shows the evolution of the construction of the building. So just to prove the point that interdisciplinary research is needed to understand this, the original house is shown in red, the first edition in green, the second in yellow, the third in blue. This was verified by archeological assessments. So this is the um, 18, 
sorry, my screen just disappeared for a second. This is the 1760 archaeological assessment of what the site looked like with the Demesa house being one building with Coquina foundation walls and a tabby floor that led out to the kitchen out building. 1785 to 1800, we can see that the building itself has expanded. There is now a loggia with a tabby floor. These post holes hold up the second floor porch, creating this loggia. And you can see that the kitchen outbuilding has an earthen floor. By 1820, that loggia has been filled in. You can see the fireplace and chimney here. So this information shows us through archaeology what the historic materials were. Why is this important? Because the challenge with this building and many colonial era buildings in St. Augustine is Coquina. This is a photo of the building from 1958 when it was the Old Spanish Inn. And originally this would have been covered with an exterior stucco that really protects the Coquina but lets it breathe. Um, in 1950s, they removed the stucco because really it looks very historic with coquina on this building, um, but it can cause damage. So what is coquina? So coquina clams lived in Florida thousands of years ago, and when they died, the shells accumulated in layers year after year, century after century for thousands of years, forming submerged deposits several feet thick. During the last ice age, the sea levels dropped, exposing the shell layers to air and rain and becoming covered with soil and trees and other vegetation. When rain percolated through the dead vegetation and the soil, it picked up carbon dioxide and became carbonic acid, the same ingredient that makes soda fizz. This acid soaked downward and dissolved some of the calcium in the shells producing calcium carbonate, which solidified in the lower layers, much like how flowstone and stalactites are formed in caves. This material was the glue that glued the shell fragments together in a porous type of limestone we now call coquina, which is Spanish for tiny shell. Many of the buildings and the Castillo are made of coquina because there was a quarry at the area that is now St. Augustine State Park. So again, the challenge here is when the coquina is exposed to acid rain or polluted waters, it eats away at that glue and erodes the coquina stone. An additional challenge here is the landscape. Historic photos from the 1950s show a very different landscape. We have cleaner surfaces. We have a clean perimeter foundation. The building is allowed to breathe. We have materials such as tabby and gravel and grass and soil that allows for water drainage. Today, we have planting pits against the wall of the building, inappropriate planting such as boxwoods, things that don't pull water from these pits. We have a hard surface of sidewalk that traps water. And we have maintenance issues such as gutter and downspout issues, overflowing rain barrels and screens in the barrels that were clogged with leaves and other debris that creates overflow. So this creates damage to the historic building. Coquina is a straw. Any water that um, is up against the coquina will be sucked up through the material. Problem one, poor design of landscape. Problem two, rain. So the exterior stucco gets wet. The water that's trapped against the building um, goes through the coquina walls and the interior plaster gets wet. This is exacerbated by a modern HVAC system and the difficulties in managing humidity in historic buildings and, let's face it, in Florida, a very tropical environment. Problem three is groundwater rise and subsidence. St. Augustine is sinking, the groundwater is rising, and these foundations of coquina do not have footings, nor are they on a concrete slab. They are in the soil. The final exacerbation, which we'll talk about in a minute, is flooding from storms and sea level rise. So the solutions at scale and by discipline for the house, HPN architecture. 
I'm working with our facilities manager on looking at the treatments of material for coquina for water protection. With the modern HVAC system and managing humidities, we are also thinking about uh, facilities management and the mechanical equipment and what we might need to do to change and adapt this. Landscape architecture and IFAS will be looking at the problems of poor design of landscape and rain. So they will be redesigning the foundation landscapes and the site landscape. But in order to do that, we want to do two things. We want to make sure the design reflects historically appropriate design for the site. So we have research that is ongoing for the site to determine what gardens might have been, what landscape might have been, and what historic uses might have been in these areas. And then lastly, we are going to recommend changing the planting and the landscape materials to include more native plants and more plants that can help with water removal. The citywide problems are the big ones. Problem three, the groundwater rise and subsidence, and the final exacerbation of the flooding. Let's face it, water knows no boundaries. And I want to show some images that my former colleague, Dr. Sujin Kim, created through a grant with the National Park Service. This shows an assessment of the flooding around the Castillo. And in the upper left, you can see that there is A1A. And just across that begins the lots that are part of and adjacent to the De Mesa Sanchez. This is using the NOAA Intermediate High Flood Projections um, for high tide in the year 2022, the year 2050, the year 2080. So you can see we have some serious issues with um, water knowing no boundaries. In the upper left, you can also see that parking lot, those hard surfaces of the parking lot um, that's going to be uh, flooded and, and frequently does get flooded. This is 2100. So interdisciplinary solutions at scale with partnerships. We have UF, we're working at the building, the lot and the neighborhood scale with the city of St. Augustine. We're gonna have to talk to DOT about what's going on with A1A. Um, that's also in, in conjunction with the stormwater infrastructure work that the city of St. Augustine is doing. The National Park Service at the Castillo, they own that land, the parking lot. The city has put in a seawall near there. Um, they have funding for a seawall. This will all affect uh, the adjacent properties in the future. And currently the Army Corps of Engineers is looking at a Florida Back Bay feasibility study. So you start to see how these scalar issues with water can affect um, buildings, lots, streets, neighborhoods, and cities. So this is our landscape assessment. This is the work that we're just beginning to do um, because basically I'm an architect. I can protect a building. I need landscape architects to help me protect the building with the site. And then we need to work with engineers, planners, others who can help us understand the regional and neighborhood context for these solutions. So what we're looking at here, what's really important to note, number one, is the yellow lots are these state-owned HSA parcels. Um, and what's critical is that this red dashed line is a City of St. Augustine project um, that is really an amazing project, stormwater infrastructure, that is going to happen throughout the city and at Lake Maria Sanchez in the south, as shown on the photo on the left. But the approximate benefit area from that project doesn't cover all of our state-owned HSA parcels. And it doesn't cover, um, as you can see, it doesn't really cover anything where A1A is or where the NPS is. So, this is going to be an interesting collaboration between the state-owned parcels, the city infrastructure, DOT, and NPS. And I just want to show you that really our um, 
our project is phase one. As you can see on the right, DeMesa Sanchez house is that yellow lot. The front part may be within the benefit area. The part closer to A1A may be without. So as water knows no boundaries, we really have to think about a larger focal area, which does include these yellow sites owned by the state and HSA, but also adjacent sites owned by private owners and A1A and the National Park Service. So we'll be looking at a neighborhood scale, um, landscape assessment and proposals for solutions. The orange areas noted as phase three are city-owned parking lots. We're gonna be looking at those too because water flows in from the river and parking lots um, and permeable materials are a great opportunity for low impact design and green infrastructure. So in progress, we have the schematic design for the DeMesa Sanchez landscape and building adaptation. And this phase two project, site assessment of flood risk, existing materials and uses, the literature review and case study for LID and green infrastructure, collaboration with adjacent property owners for short-term and long-term planning, historical landscape research, and native plantings outreach and education, um, IFAS and the City of St. Augustine's Historic Preservation Board are working together to assess their historic plantings list in collaboration with the Florida Friendly Landscape Native Plants list, and we'll be presenting this information at a table and booth at the History Festival in the city of St. Augustine in May. By summer, we plan on discussing our progress and potential options with Historic St. Augustine, and we anticipate that this is a multi-year project that will continue with design, implementation, and additional phases. And with that, I will give it over to Linda Stevenson uh, to present Pinellas County. Linda, would Great. you like to share your screen? Yes, let me let me go ahead and do that, please. Thank you. Great. Okay. Okay, there. We're still seeing your PowerPoint. Oh, okay. There you go. There you go. That's good. Okay, great. Thank you. Just hide, hide those. We're, we're on the critical asset slide. Here we are. Okay, great. And just try to move us out of the way here. Not that I don't want to see everyone, but <laughs> sorry. There we go. Oh no. Yeah. And and Kate and Mary, if you if you want to mute your or if you want to just um um uh um sign off your video you'll be able to hear if if you want to do that okay sorry i'm having trouble hiding us bear with me one second please let me fix this like the video panel ha huh. okay there we go great okay well thanks thank you so much clary um, so uh, Kate and I are happy to present to you today the Heritage Resources at Risk in Pinellas County project. So this project's been ongoing for a while in multiple phases. It initially began as a traditional historic resource survey type of project from 2020 to 2021, where we documented a select group of sites 
based on state grant funding, which typically calls for a certain amount of sites to be documented through their inventory process. And uh, we've continued through phase two, and now we're currently in phase three. So as you can see, typically we only survey generally uh, about 400 sites roughly per project. And there's a whole lot more sites, of course, that are available than, than the survey grants typically fund. So one of our recent uh, projects here was this little frame house right on the shores of the Ankle River in a velocity zone. It was built in a mid-century site built in uh, 1951. So the, the impetus for the project came about uh, for the particular project we're talking about today uh, through some legislation that happened in Florida in 2021, the critical historic uh, assets um, in the uh, res resilient Florida grant program. So what was interesting about this particular legislation is that the legislature is acknowledging that the state is quite vulnerable to these adverse effects from flooding from various sources, including higher rainfall events, storm surge events, and uh, also, also, of course, sea level rise. And that these impacts are causing adverse effects throughout the communities, throughout the counties, throughout the municipalities, in areas of health and safety, social, environmental, and economic challenges. So the state decided that to most effectively address these issues, they would allocate funding in a manner that prioritized addressing the most significant risks. The second part of the legislation was that the legislature recognized that a coordinated approach to maximizing the benefits of these, these efforts, this project that they're undertaking would improve the state's resilience to flooding and sea level rise. And most significant for us as preservationists is that uh, the legislature also recognized certain categories of assets that they're calling critical assets. So those are things like you might typically imagine um, in conservation lands, parks, shorelines, but they included historical and cultural assets in this category. So the, the preservation planner in uh, Pinellas County came up with this really great idea of creating this geospatial database of all the critical historic heritage assets basically within the county. Surprisingly, there is no uniform source of all of that information to date. It's multiple agencies, multiple levels of government, all have their own pieces of the puzzle. The state has a certain data set, but there is no comprehensive data set. So our challenge was to go ahead and create this comprehensive data set for Pinellas County. Additionally, we're listing not only assets that are recognized by a state, uh, county or local government or uh, national register, but also assets that are considered likely or possible. So that's a whole separate category of information that resides in different places and different silos as well. So um, here's, I guess, the scope of the problem to explain it best. When we looked at the property appraiser data set, there's over 200,000 assets in Pinellas County that were built before 1976. And at least 55,000 of those assets are located within special flood hazard areas, which is depicted on the map here. Our 100 year flood uh, zone is the dark blue. And all of these little tiny dots that you see scattered everywhere, those are all of the currently listed heritage assets, of which there are about 13,000 recognized across uh, at the state level. So our project um, involved not only working with multiple disciplines, but we also worked with different layers of government too. Pinellas County has 24 municipalities, and seven of those municipalities are what are considered certified local governments which means uh, they have appropriate preservation ordinances that allows them to take certain actions at the local level. And on our particular team, we collaborated not only with the unincorporated area of Pinellas County itself, but also the cities of Tarpon Springs, Dunedin, St. Petersburg, and St. Pete Beach as this first part of our project. The strategy was to create a robust countywide geodatabase of historical resources built on an ESRI platform and including these multiple scales of information from the national level, the state, and all of our local sources. 
We also needed to create this geo database so that it could be accessible to multiple user types from the casual user that wanted to just know what if their house is historic, all the way up to the floodplain managers and the preservation planners and other local officials as well. And we also wanted the platform to be adaptable for data analysis for any kind of additional planning study that we might undertake in the future. So as a result, um, this project involved multiple disciplines. Uh, the typical ones you would find on a historic resource survey, including planning, planners, architectural historians, historians, and historic preservationists. And in this case, we also involved uh, GIS and data management, as well as the emergency management offices of all of our partners. So we had multiple disciplines um, operating. Here, this image here is actually in Tarpon Springs. Uh, the little historic districts of Tarpon Springs are prone to uh, actually um, sunny day flooding. And that was an example of that. So I'll just establish what we do when we do a historic resource survey. Surveys are a critical step in historic preservation planning because we're creating an inventory of resources. This way we know what we have before any further actions are taken. These surveys document existing conditions and they will ca typically capture our resources and these assets at a very specific moment in time. We will then evaluate properties at a preliminary level to determine if there's perhaps some significance there and that further designation may be desired. And then we also record the precise geographic location of these resources. The inventory system we used, it was derived by the state of Florida in their Florida master site file system. So just a brief background on what that means. This is the state of Florida's official inventory for historical and cultural resources. The uh, agency here maintains copies of, of all of the survey reports, the documents themselves, the geo database, and the manuscripts of the assets listed in their inventory. The current holdings include over 200,000 cultural resources statewide and include over 22,000 manuscripts. So preservation is an important way for us to transmit our understanding, of course, from the past to future generations. But it's important to understand that this inventory that the state holds has no regulatory impact on property per se. It's simply an inventory. And just so you understand our process, uh, our traditional process, we would be out in the field gathering field data. Uh, currently, we've developed a, an app using an ESRI platform called Survey123. And we're using that on a number of our current survey projects going forward. The beauty of the phone app is that you can also take the pictures with the phone. It's automatically linked to the geo reference point on um, the app itself. So all of that relevant information is neatly in one package there. We also, in an iterative process, research information from various archival sources, including um, the state archives and local archives. Certainly the local property appraisers data is fed into our, our study, as well as other types of databases that may exist. And then lastly, we do a preliminary evaluation of the property to see if it may, there may be some potential um, meeting of significance for the National Register or a local designation, perhaps. And so I just want to mention about local designations. Most people are familiar with the National Register of Historic Places. The limitations of this are it's an honorary designation, it's quite prestigious, but there is no regulatory power associated with being on the National Register per se. At the local level is where really the, the regulatory aspect comes into play in that um, through the permitting process at the local level, typically that's where review of treatment of historic properties can occur and both uh, National Register and a local landmark or local district do recognize significance of a property. So uh, with this, I'm gonna turn this over to Kate and I'll advance the slides for Kate and uh, she will present to you the creation of this geospatial database. Hi everyone, I'm Kate Norris and I work at the Geoplan Center. Um, so we're gonna talk about our mapping resource needs now. So we've just heard from Linda that there's a very large need to gather all this information put it together in one container and then display it to the world. So what we've learned is that we need to create an adaptable public facing map viewer that can meet the needs 
of different historic preservation specialists, including county and municipal disaster recovery personnel, on-ground historic preservation data collection consultants, the general public, and more. So to do all this, there are six steps to building a geospatial database-driven map viewer. First, we have to determine what the data needs are. We need to collect and manage the data. We need data standardization. We need data quality assurance. We need data integration, and we need data display. And we're gonna talk about that in the next couple of slides. Okay, so first off, the data needs. The data needs are determined by the county project lead. And so we've had discussions with the county project lead over what they need for their varying users. Um, their data needs include base layers, such as property data, um, FEMA flood data, coastal high hazard or storm surge zones, um, repetitive loss areas. They also need access to the state level data, whether it's historic structures or cemeteries or um, historic districts. And then they also need access to the local data. And so the local data is gonna come in from different groups as we've discussed. So now that we've determined the data needs, we need to go get the data. So now we need to work with the state and the seven certified local governments to acquire the available GIS and tabular data. Next, we need to create a data management system. For us, this data management system is an ArcGIS platform file geodatabase, which we can then use to build the web viewer with. Next. Okay, so we've gone and we've gathered all this information. And so what we have to do now is we have to standardize the data. So we're getting data from a variety of sources. It's all coming in, it's all different. So data, um, standardization is accomplished by defining a single tabular and spatial format for each of the work items defined by the data needs section. So what does this all mean? This means that we need to combine all the information coming in, for, say for example, just the local significant properties. And so we need to get all that information. The information is coming in as address information in a in an Excel table. It's coming in as a point data set. It's coming in as a polygon data set. It's coming in with all different fields based on all the different, what all the different municipalities are, are seeing as their needs. And so we need to gather it all and then figure out one standard to meet. We need a single master table structure in a GIS spatial format to, in, to get this all together. Okay, so we've gathered all this information. So now the next thing we need to do is we need to do some data quality assurance. And we're doing data quality assurance because we are creating a public facing web viewer. What we don't want is we don't want the general public coming and saying, hey, I opened the viewer up and boom, instantly I saw this problem. We wanna catch those problems before anyone else sees those problems. So what we need to do is we need to review and clean up. And this is accomplished by visual spot checking to find where are the major problems first. GIS analysis, manual cleanup, and final review. And so what we're going to talk about now is just a general example of some of the data cleanup issues that we've found. Um, as Linda has discussed, the state has a collection of data. They have a very large database of historic structures for the state of Florida. Some of these um, points for this data set are on the National Registry, and some are um, in the data set, but don't necessarily carry historical significance. It's kind of like they've been documented, but they haven't been added to a local registry. Um, and so for the Florida Master um, Site File Structures data set, we know later down the line that we are gonna need to do data integration. And so we wanna make sure that our data integration is occurring at the parcel boundary level. And the Florida Master Site File data is a, a database that has been collected over a very long period of time and at different scales. And so when you collect data at different scales, you can have data accuracy issues. And so as we see on screen here, there is a map and there's a bunch of orange dots all over the place. These are the point locations for a small area for the Florida master site file within Pinellas County. The um, orange dots that are kind of near the green dots, those are the information that we're saying, hey, when we re-geocoded this information based off of the addresses, these parcels, um, these points were ending up in the same parcel. 
And so we've run some GIS analysis to try to figure out, can we use this moving forward? How are we going to move this, use this moving forward? And we found that out of the 12,000 records, we had roughly 25% that were not geocoding to the correct location. And you can kind of see that in the center of the screen where we have some orange dots and then some lines to parcels very far away. And so we had to do data cleanup on approximately 25% of the records. Um, in addition, we discovered that across the 12,000 records that 11% were now destroyed, but not documented in the Florida master site file. And that's another major issue. We don't wanna be citing property as being historic if that property is now destroyed. Um, so finding out where all these problems are before we start showing the world what we have. Um, luckily 64% were great and in the right place and we were able to move along from that. So now that we've taken all of our data, we've standardized it, we've cleaned up the data that we can clean up and shift to a proper location, we can now move to the next step. Okay, so here we are again. Here's our data quality review. You can see on screen a little bit more what I was saying, where we have all these lines or where these points are moving to. And so this is very dirty data. And this occurs in a lot of GIS data sets if they've been collected over a period of time. And this can happen with a lot of historic data sets because historic information is gathered over a long period of time. So this is an issue that you could see arising in other projects. So now we're going to talk about data integration and display. We know that there are flooding issues. We know that there's historic um, significance. We need to get everything together. How are we going to get everything together? We are going to do some data integration, and that involves the process of tying together base layers, such as the FEMA flood hazards, the coastal storm surge, and a lot of this stuff also helps to predict what areas are going to be impacted by the sea level rise. And we have our historic resource layers, our state layers and our local layers that we've all just standardized and put together. And we're gonna do data integration of this information with the county level parcel information. So we're gonna tie this information to the parcels. So then when we do our flood analysis and we know what, what um, parcels are impacted at 20% or greater for a flood, that the structures on that parcel could be impacted as well. So we can do we can summarize this information to figure out where are our imp what's being impacted, what are our impacts, and how do we protect these areas. Okay, so now we've done this data integration. Now what we can do is we can um, create an ArcGIS web map viewer, and this can now be designed for the display of interactive historic resource GIS data. Web maps contain a base map, a set of data layers, including interactive pop-ups with information about the data, a legend, and navigation tools to pan and zoom. So this is our Pinellas Historic Resource Dashboard. Um, this is the geospatial database-driven map viewer. I did not build this map viewer. This map viewer was built by my um, colleague, Eric Finley, who also works at the Geoplan Center. I'm the data side, and he is the visualization side. Um, Eric took the information that we put together, and he created the web viewer. And we've had many meetings with our county project lead to figure out how do we display all of this information in a way that meets their needs. They are gonna have a variety of users with a variety of requirements. How do we digest all this information and provide it to not only them, but also to the public? As you can see in the top image to the left, that is how you look, how it looks when you first open the dashboard. Um, the larger circles show you where the highest density of information is. And as we zoom in, um, the um, image on the bottom left, we can start to see the Greek town area. And that is one of the historic districts. So as we zoom into the Greek town even further, the parcel information pops up. And if we were to hover over and ID one of the properties, as you can see in blue in the image to the right, we can see um, tabular information in the pop-up that shows us that it has a site ID that it is on the National Register. And we can also see that it's part of a historic district that is contributing. We can see that it's in the 100 and 500 year floodplains and that it is in the category one or greater floodplain zone. And this is providing our user with a lot of information very quickly. Now, all the information that has been performed at the data integration level to the parcel layer exists as like a snapshot of the information available. 
all of the point information that contains all of the local tabular information or all of the state information is still available to the users. But to provide that all at once can be a lot to take on. So now the user has access to this summary level of information, and now they can turn on more defined information if they choose to. Um, dashboards are a great way of displaying this type of information, and other users can create them too, and they are hosted um, at the UF site. And here's an example below. Great, thank, thank you very much, Kate. Um, so just to wrap up our section here, some future projects coming online for which we'll use a very similar process, uh, again, working with Pinellas County, there's a real interest in naturally occurring affordable housing units. And so most of the historic districts, particularly pre-war, often have these detached garage structures with little apartments above them, and there really is no count of those. So that was another project that may be uh, coming down the line later. A couple of other options would include things like vacant, um, st a study of repurposing vacant mid-century commercial spaces and also legacy business inventories. So these are just some of the um, applications that we've discussed for this, this process. So with that, um, I'll close our section of the report and turn it back to Dr. Larkin. Thanks, Linda. I just wanted to wrap up, um, well, first by saying that the project that Linda and Kate and Eric are working on is really important for the state of Florida because DHR, the State Historic Preservation Office, manages this FMSF database. And as we all know, technology and geospatial databases are the way that information is managed right now. Um, and so we're really trying to provide a standard um, that everyone across the state can use. And with this Pinellas County project, it's been really great because it's such a good example of how multiple layers of data overlap at different scales, um, including, you know, flood zones down to the lot. So um, with that project, um, you'll see on here a couple of other surveys, and we are going to continue to test our process with our survey app with geospatial databases um, for other neighborhood surveys that we will be working on in the future. And then the last thing I just wanted to say is that we have a lot of current and potentially upcoming projects. And um, I just wanted to kind of talk a little bit about these as a note to people who may be interested in some of these areas or topics or themes, but also because we have a lot of partners that we work with not only in DCP, but outside of the UF community in cities and counties and other locations. So our two Nantucket projects that we're currently working on are wrapping up the heritage and housing study. That's been an ongoing project um, in partnership with the town of Nantucket, the Schimberg Center for Housing Research, Dr. Maria Watson, and with UFHP. Um, so we're really considering the housing crisis on Nantucket and how heritage has positively or negatively impacted that crisis. We're about to embark on our new project on Nantucket, Intangible Heritage at Risk. This is our summer field course project, but will be continued afterwards. This is looking at um, traditions on the island that are at risk from climate change. And we'll be working with our partners on the island who focus on science, ecological conservation, um, and here at UF with faculty who will be guest lecturing on sustainable tourism and cultural landscapes. Um, I mentioned the surveys. We're doing a lot of work in Jacksonville. Linda's leading the Springfield Historic District Resurvey right now. We are hopeful to continue working in Jacksonville on surveys and community engagement with um, an updated survey for North Riverside and working with other UF faculty um, here in DCP and in tandem with Fiber and Schimberg Center for that neighborhood and other adjacent neighborhoods um, in Jacksonville. We are also hopefully um, about to receive funding this summer for the New Guinea Neighborhood Survey. This is the um, original settlement of uh, free African Americans in Nantucket, and we'll be partnering with UMass Archaeology to really consider how below ground and above ground work 
tells a holistic story about place. Linda has been undertaking some preservation planning work with the City of Gainesville's Historic Preservation Officer and Historic Preservation Board in her class this spring. And we are in talks with Miami-Dade County to look at tourism and preservation planning down there. And lastly, speaking of scale, we are going to be embarking on some statewide projects that look at cemetery preservation, the heritage of the Gullah Geechee and land reclamation, as well as green book projects and civil rights sites. And these really work with other disciplines such as history, archaeology, anthropology, museum studies, and factor in technology like GIS, like laser scanning, and potentially looking at um, some of the legal issues and development um, that is happening right now across Florida. And with that, I will pass it back to Meg and we'll be happy to take any questions. So oh, Linda, thank can you. you go to the next screen real quick, please, Linda? It's got our contact information on it. There we go. Mm -hmm. If anybody wants to contact us, they can use those emails. So um, we do have uh, about eight minutes left for questions. Um, if anybody has any, feel free to unmute yourself or go ahead and type them into the chat. Um, wonderful presentation, Clary, Linda, and Kay. This is really interesting stuff. Um, so in, in terms of um, waiting for folks to, to get their questions uh, typed into the chat, uh, how do you envision addressing the challenge of preserving and restoring historical sites um, in a place like Florida while simultaneously um, looking at how we tackle the pressing issue of housing shortages driven by the influx of residents from other states? Do you see this, um, this issue coexisting or do you see these things fighting against one another? I guess I can start to answer that and then Linda, if you have anything to add for the work that you're doing as well. Um, it's not just an issue in Florida is the first thing I wanna say. This is an issue that is pervasive across the United States, um, especially uh, noticeable in our work in Nantucket. One of the things that I find very interesting about Florida and about Nantucket and potentially historic places in coastal areas these are areas that their economies are based on heritage tourism. And so with the rise of short-term rentals, with the rise of second and third houses on the coast, um, you know, these are creating shortages for people who need them. For example, the service industry. Um, I know in St. Augustine, land cost in the historic district and adjacent areas have risen so much um, that there is a lot of displacement. Same for Nantucket. Um, there's not even enough housing in Nantucket for teachers to find houses, for firemen, for policemen. Um, this is a really critical issue. I think one of the important things that we can start doing is considering the definition of preservation. You know, are we preserving a building in its perfect original condition? No, that's the old preservation. Um, what we need to be considering is preserving buildings, housing, neighborhoods, A, for the people that currently and historically have lived there, um, preventing displacement from gentrification, and B, preserving buildings through adaptation and rehabilitation. And again, this is where it gets to managing change and recognizing significance. So what is significant for the community that they want to preserve, that they want to be there and experience? And then how can we retain that while managing the change, the change that's needed for affordable housing? Uh, preservation and housing are going to have a lot of work to do together um, in order to even remotely touch upon a solution for this project. Great. Thank you so much for that answer. That's that's very insightful. Um, we have another question that's been typed into the chat. How often is the historic resource survey undertaken or updated? Linda, that's your court. <laughs> well, therein lies the problem. <laughs> so um, there was a spate of historic resource surveys of communities that were done in the 70s and 80s, you know, driven by the 
passage of the um, Preservation Act of 1966 and available funding. And many of those surveys have not been updated. So for example, in Jacksonville in the Springfield neighborhood, the original survey was done 1979, 1980. And we are now just now in the process of updating that particular survey. And this has occurred uh, certainly across the state and I'm sure across other regions of the, the country as well. And we're finding a lot of those earlier resources are gone or are heavily modified and things that were not of the appropriate age to study a little bit further to see if they were significant are have now reached that threshold of age. So we anticipate a pretty uh, big um, expansion to that district as well as documenting the loss of resources that originally created that district. So with that goes the story of the community and how that context changes and how we tell that ongoing narrative. And I just want to add to that by saying that the survey is such an important part of the work. Um, the One of my former colleagues used to say, you can't preserve it unless you know it exists. And it's such a great way of thinking about it. Documentation is the critical first step. And so the work that Linda and Kate are doing on developing standards and, and best practices for survey and documentation and data organization is going to be critical um, for us to have in order to continue to survey and develop, you know, solutions for challenges across our historic neighborhoods. Great, uh, th thank you. <laughs> um, so uh, any further questions? We probably have time for one more if um, anybody has a question for the presenters. Okay, seeing nothing, I guess we can go ahead and adjourn for the day. Um, deep gratitude to Dr. Larkin, Dr. Stevenson, and Dr. Norris for an incredible presentation. Um, this is really riveting stuff. Um, I'm probably biased here, but I think it's really, <laughs> you guys are doing amazing work and it's so important. Um, so again, uh, thanks to those of you who were able to join us during this lunch hour presentation. The recording will be posted um, on the various different social media channels that Kyle has kindly posted in the chat. Um, and look forward to seeing you all for future presentations um, that we will send out announcements to um, in the upcoming weeks. Thanks, everyone.